Restrooms in the Wild West didn't have the luxurious bathing amenities we're accustomed to, and they weren't often formal spaces. Instead, pioneers, settlers, cowboys, and their counterparts resorted to using outhouses, pots, and whatever nature provided. When nature called, individuals in the American West might have sought refuge behind the shelter of a tree. As time passed, settlers and others crafted distinctive outhouses in the style of the Old West for the same purpose. However, the charm of these structures was often overshadowed by their less than pleasant qualities. All in all, the experience of using a cowboy restroom was an escapade of its own, filled with unique sights and fragrances. In the era of the Old West, toilet paper, a luxury of more recent times, remained absent from everyday life. The settlers resorted to various alternatives, utilizing materials at hand, such as blades of grass, weathered corn cobs, or even snippets of printed news. Corn held a prominent role within the diet, economy, and ethos of the American Western regions. A local from Nebraska during the mid-1800s, Bell Madison, reminisced about the multi-purpose use of corn cobs and husks as not just makeshift toilet paper but also as fuel and playthings. The employment of corn cobs as cleansing agents proved to be functional. Positioned conveniently near the outhouses, they were seized by users before entering. Following their ablutions, individuals would cleanse themselves repeatedly, maneuvering the cob across sensitive areas in varied motions. Despite the eventual introduction of actual toilet paper, numerous denizens of the West persisted in their preference for corn cobs, foregoing paper alternatives. Alternatively, some folks, disregarding availability, chose to forego any wiping material altogether. Outbuildings known as outhouses, or privies, were commonly positioned a distance away from the main dwelling. These structures were often quite basic, consisting mainly of four walls, surrounding a hole dug into the earth, generally about five or six feet deep. It was also preferable if there was some sort of roof overhead. With dimensions typically around three to four square feet, these outhouses lacked amenities such as heating, lighting, and proper ventilation. As time passed, either when the hole within the outhouse was filled or when the odor became overwhelmingly unpleasant, the pit was concealed, prompting the relocation of the outhouse to a new spot. The same modest walls were then reassembled above a fresh excavation. Primarily constructed from timber, these outdoor lavatories carried an inherent element of risk. The seating arrangements consisted essentially of enclosures with elliptical openings. The seat surfaces were ideally designed to be comfortable, but assurance in this regard was far from guaranteed. The seats, doors, and walls themselves presented potential dangers of splinters, particularly following frequent utilization and prolonged exposure to varying weather conditions. Even the materials employed for personal hygiene, such as corn cobs, newspapers, and primitive forms of toilet paper, were not immune to the presence of splinters. This led Northern Tissue to emphasize the safety of their product by advertising it as splinter-free as late as the year 1935. Lye or lime found frequent application in alleviating unpleasant smells from outdoor toilets. Following each use, either of these substances could be deposited into the pit. Broadly speaking, lime was perceived as an effective agent for disinfection, and it was frequently introduced generously with urine or waste. Lime was reasonably priced and accessible. Additionally, it found utility in cleansing the insides of outhouses, improving their hygiene and visual appeal. Lye, sharing a similar role as a disinfectant, also proved proficient in breaking down refuse. As the refuse accumulated, the scent within an outdoor restroom grew more pronounced. As a result, this drew the attention of flies and various other insects. Even substantial applications of lye or lime couldn't fully ward off the smells or the pests, especially throughout the sweltering days of summer. During the heat, visits to the outdoor restroom were necessarily brief. As flies lightly brushed against one's rear, there arose a pressing need to attend to one's necessities promptly. The flies that were drawn to the outdoor restroom also found their way into living quarters, and with a scarcity of window screens to deter them, they congregated around food and other goods. However, flies weren't the solitary insects that required vigilance from those using the outdoor restroom. Spiders could deliver bites to exposed skin, and mosquitoes might swoop down on restroom occupants while they were attending to their affairs. Carved crescent shapes, 
often portrayed on the doors of outhouses in various forms of media, might have been engraved on select outhouse doors, but this practice was not universal. It's worth noting that there exists no written or photographic evidence predating 1930 that confirms the widespread existence of crescent moons on such doors. According to certain historical accounts, it's been conjectured that crescent moons could have denoted outhouses designated for female use. These moons, representative of Luna, the goddess of the moon, potentially served as a symbol to provide direction for those who couldn't read. In contrast, outhouses intended for male use could have been identified by stars. The perforations found on the doors of outhouses might have indeed served the purpose of distinguishing users, but they also allowed essential light and ventilation. Additionally, these openings doubled as handles for opening the outhouse door, adding to their functionality. Facing the winter months brought its own set of difficulties when it came to making a trip to the outdoor restroom. The frigid temperatures often led to the solidification of waste, hastening its accumulation until it nearly reached the brim of the designated pit. Venturing outside in the cold was far from an inviting prospect. To sidestep the inconvenience of heading to the outdoor facility, pioneers in the American West turned to indoor conveniences known as chamber pots, dubbed as thunder mugs. These receptacles were strategically placed close to or beneath the sleeping area. When utilized during the nighttime hours, their contents would be emptied into the designated outhouse, a nearby water source, or simply disposed of outside the window come morning. As pioneers journeyed towards the western frontier, their chosen mode of transportation was frequently the train. In the early days, travelers would make use of facilities at the various stops on their route. However, as the journeys grew in duration, the trains had to address the fundamental necessities of their passengers. In the midst of the 19th century, certain trains began to incorporate compact washrooms for the convenience of travelers, although the conveniences provided to those traveling first class were modest when viewed through the lens of contemporary expectations. The train lavatories consisted of two compartments, a restroom and a storage area. For gentlemen, the storage area, what present-day observers might refer to as a restroom, often contained a wooden enclosure with an opening at the top. By utilizing the chute mechanism, human waste would simply be disposed of onto the tracks. Both men and women had access to washing facilities within the restroom compartments, though the women's facilities were comparatively more comfortable and possibly included commodes. Immigrants journeying on these trains didn't have the luxury of a designated space or seating. Instead, they were provided with a wooden panel in the floor that could be lifted, revealing the tracks below. Outhouses served as facilities for people of various ages and genders. Rather than featuring multiple separate structures, some outhouses were designed with multiple openings tailored to accommodate individuals of varying sizes. The intention behind constructing multi-opening outhouses was not to facilitate simultaneous use by multiple individuals. Outhouses with three openings included spacious cutouts meant for men, moderately sized seats for women, and even smaller wooden openings intended for children. In the case of two opening outhouses, there existed a larger seat for adults, alongside a smaller seat, specifically crafted for children. In the days of old, the use of an outdoor toilet or a chamber pot wasn't always the only option available, particularly when the forest or a stream could serve the purpose. In countryside locations, there was no significant peril in wandering towards the trees when one felt the urge. Nevertheless, disposing of human waste in a river or a similar water passage might inadvertently release pollutants downstream, affecting nearby inhabitants. A similar risk was present if an outhouse was positioned in close proximity to a water reservoir. In conclusion, delving into the bathroom practices of the Wild West era reveals a rugged yet resourceful approach to sanitation. With the absence of modern conveniences, Individuals relied on simple solutions in the face of nature's call. Outhouses and makeshift arrangements often played a role, highlighting the ingenuity of adapting to the environment.